House Valarian is often overlooked in the modern timeline of A Song of Ice and Fire and the Game of Thrones TV show, but its impact on the history of Westeros isn't something that should be understated. Their naval dominance was rivaled only by the Ironborn, and the position of Master of Ships was believed to be a hereditary title that passed down the Valarian line. But one seafarer of the house stands head and shoulders above the rest, Corlys Valarion who was also known as the Sea Snake. Corliss's casting in The House of the Dragon made news recently. Many fans may be unaware of his significance, so I'd like to do my part to explain why he's such a big deal. For the spoiler-sensitive among you, I'm including a spoiler meter up here that you can use if you need to jump ahead, but I will be breaking the video down into three parts of varying spoileriness. This video is intended to be a primer for the House of the Dragon show, so I will try to avoid spoilers for what I think will appear on screen. But I can't be 100% sure of what that will be. The first part of the video will focus on the origin and brief history of House Valarian up until Corliss's birth. Part 2 will be about Corliss's life from his birth up until him becoming Lord of the House and part three will be from that point until the time I believe the show will pick up. Let's get started. As their name implies, the Valarians originate from Valyria, like their Targaryen overlords. Unlike the Targaryens, though, the Valarians were never dragon lords and were instead minor nobility like the third Valyrian house of Westeros the Celtigars. The Valarians traveled to Westeros even earlier than the Targaryens. We know that the Targaryens arrived 412 years before the start of A Game of Thrones. And we also know that the Valyrian Freehold has been set up on the island of Dragonstone for almost two centuries before the Targaryens took ownership, so the Valarians may have arrived any time in that window. The Valarians settled on the island of Driftmark, southwest of Dragonstone, in Blackwater Bay, where they ruled from a castle of the same name. After the Doom, the blood of Valyria was in short supply, so the Targaryens were happy to have their close allies the Valarians nearby for marriages. Aegon and his sisters were actually born to a Valarian mother, and when they began their conquest, Lord Ethan Valarian earned his title of Master of Ships by transporting the Targaryen forces across Blackwater Bay and continuing to provide naval support for the rest of the campaign. The loyalty of the house was proved once again when Lord Ethan's brother, Sir Corlys Valarian, another one, was named the first Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. The closeness of the two houses and the Valarian custom of sending their male children out to sea at an early age ensured that the Targaryens almost always had a Valarian master of ships. During the reign of Maegor the Cruel, Lord Daemon Valarian would be the first one to publicly back the claim of the young Jaehaerys, who would eventually succeed his tyrannical uncle and reign so long that he became known as the Old King. Lord Daemon became the Hand of the King and vacated the office of Master of Ships, and King Jaehaerys named Manfred Redwine as the first non-Valarian to hold the title. Our Corlys Valarian was born five years into the reign of Jaehaerys I. Like most young boys of his house, Corlys was put out to sea at a young age, making his first trip across the narrow sea at six. He would make similar trips every year after that. But if you're thinking that this young lordling was being given pleasure cruises or vacations, that wasn't the case. Corliss worked as a cabin boy, learning the mariner's craft from the bottom up, doing dirty and strenuous work alongside the crew. Although he was seen as a gifted sailor, it wasn't until age 16 when he was given command of a fishing boat for a voyage from Driftmark to Dragonstone and back. From there, Corliss would begin traveling the common trading routes, sailing around Dorne to Old Town and Lannisport, to Lordsport in the Iron Islands, and across the Narrow Sea to Lys, Tyrosh, Pentos, and Myr. But the still young Corliss would plan even more ambitious excursions. He would take the Summer Maid to Volantis, 
right by his ancestral home of Valyria, and would learn to navigate the open sea by making the trip to the Summer Isles. His next trip would see him heading north on the Ice Wolf, stopping by Bravos and Loroth on his way to the port of Ibn, which is about as far east as Karth and Ves Dothrak, and would even stop by Eastwatch by the Sea and Hardhome as he traveled past the wall towards his real goal, finding a way around the north of Westeros. This was sadly not to be, and Corlys would head back to Driftmark to take his experiences and prepare for even greater adventures. And it would seem that this knowledge was put to good use, as Corlys was able to design and build a ship that would become as legendary as its creator, the Sea Snake. This would be the ship that would take Corlys on his nine grand voyages. The first would be along the trade routes of southern Essos, where he would travel about as far east as the most daring of traders to Yi Ti and Leng, bringing rare silks, jades, and spices back home with him. With this first trip, Corlys had already doubled the fortune of House Valarion, but that didn't mean he would rest on his laurels. His second trip would prove more costly, as many trips to a shy by the shadow do, where Corlys reportedly lost half his crew. But this didn't deter him, and Corlys's next trip would see him become the first Westerosi to reach Nefer by traveling through the Thousand Islands. The treasures he amassed on these and his next five voyages would be put to good use, since for his ninth trip, Corlys loaded his ship's hold with gold, sailed to Carth, bought twenty ships, and stuffed them with spices, elephants, and other goods. This was such a good investment that even though only fourteen ships made it back to Westeros and all the elephants died, House Valarion still became the richest in Westeros surpassing even the Lannisters and Hightowers for some time. After returning home, Corlys's Lord Grandfather passed away, making him the new Patriarch of the House. He would put his newfound riches and position to use, building a new castle on the island of Driftmark to act as a new family seat. The new castle was made from the same pale stone as the Eyrie, but with roofs topped with silver. The Driftwood Throne, which was housed at Castle Driftmark, made the trip over the causeway at low tide to its new home, which would be called High Tide. There would be even more new construction on the island of Driftmark, with Lord Corliss's treasures encouraging the development of several fishing villages into two towns, Hull and Spice Town and Corliss would regain his family's traditional title, succeeding Manfred Redwine as Master of Ships. Doesn't seem like there would have been much competition. At age 37, the Sea Snake, as Corliss was now known, married the young Princess Rhaenys, daughter of the Crown Prince Aemon. Corliss's ambition seemed to have paid off, as this would put him as close to the Iron Throne as a non-royal could be, it was now very possible that he would become either the consort or parent of a future monarch. So this is where we start to get into real potential spoiler territory. I'm going to skip over some of the finer points of the politics and conflicts, but try to set things up for the show. If you're at all concerned about being spoiled for House of the Dragon, skip ahead till the spoiler meter is green again. Before Corlys departed on a campaign against pirates with Prince Aemon, Rhaenys told him that she was expecting their first child. The prince would not survive the campaign, meaning King Jaehaerys would have to decide on an heir. Unfortunately for the Valarians, instead of passing from Aemon to Aemon's daughter Rhaenys, the heirship of the throne was passed to Aemon's brother Balon, due to Rhaenys being a woman. This was a controversial decision. Rhaenys confronted the king over it, claiming that Jaehaerys was taking her birthright and those of her children. Corlys actually resigned his position on the small council over the decision and moved back home to High Tide. He and Rhaenys would have two children at this time, Lena, a daughter, followed by Lenor, a son. Having a son wouldn't change things when Balon also died prematurely, though. 
Rather than having the heirship pass to Lenor, who was the grandson of Jaehaerys' eldest son, the king called a grand council, who chose Balon's eldest son Viserys instead. The reasoning here was that the throne should always pass down the male line first. Viserys would inherit the throne shortly after this, becoming King Viserys I. After the death of King Viserys' wife, Queen Emma Arryn, there was pressure for Viserys to take Lena Valarian as a wife, and mend some of the enmity between the Valerian-blooded houses. But Corlys and Rhaenys were snubbed for a third time when Viserys wed Alicent Hightower, daughter of Otto Hightower, who was Hand of the King. This decision also angered Daemon Targaryen, Viserys' younger brother, who had a rivalry with the Hand. Sick of the state of things at King's Landing, Daemon and Corlys decided they would dress another concern, the invasion of the Stepstones by the Triarchy of Lys, Mir, and Tyrosh. Though more orderly than the pirates who were there before, the Triarchy used their control of the Stepstones to extort tolls from passing trading ships, something that Corlys obviously wasn't a fan of. With Corlys's navy and Daemon's command of the army, the Stepstones soon fell under Targaryen control, but rather than kneeling to Viserys on the Iron Throne, the people of the Stepstones would fall under the dominion of Daemon, King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea. Viserys's oldest child from Emma Arryn was Rhaenyra Targaryen, who was known as the Realm's Delight. Unlike his father, Viserys unquestionably favored his daughter as his heir. Even after marrying Alicent Hightower, having a son named Aegon through her, Viserys wouldn't hear of any talk of passing Rhaenyra over, and in fact dismissed Otto Hightower from court and his position as Hand when he would not drop the subject. Rhaenyra's grooming, heirship, and life at court are another story, but the important thing to note is that she would eventually wed Corlys's son Laenor and she was a favorite of Daemon Targaryen. This cemented the rivalry between the two second houses of the realm, with the Valarians having ties to Rhaenyra and Daemon, and the High Towers backing Aemon, the young prince's claim, which would eventually lead to the formation of the Black and Green factions, whose conflicts would become known as the Dance of the Dragons. And I think that's a good place to stop. We can't be too sure about where the show starts, and I may have let something slip already. But this should be a good primer for Corlys Velaryon and the show The House of the Dragon. Corlys's impact on the Seven Kingdoms is often overshadowed by his nine voyages, but I anticipate that he will be somewhat of a fan favorite along with his ally Daemon and his daughter-in-law Rhaenyra. I think both of them might be worth a bit more of an in-depth look before the show starts, but what do you think? Are there any characters or concepts you'd like me to break down before the House of the Dragon? Let me know down in the comments, and feel free to point out anything I missed without getting too spoilery. If you liked the video, please give it a like and a share. I'm trying to reach 500 subscribers and I'm planning to celebrate reaching that milestone with a giveaway of a book box set for either The Witcher, A Song of Ice and Fire, or another similar fantasy series. If you'd like to enter, or just support a small creator, hit that subscribe button and keep an eye out for more of my fantasy explanation videos. This has been a storm of stories. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you at the next one.